Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nancy Lindborg. I'm the president of the United States Institute of Peace, and welcome everybody. I'm delighted uh, that you're able to join us here today. For those of you visiting for the first time, U.S. Institute of Peace was founded by our Congress uh, in 1984, dedicated to the proposition that peace is possible, that it's very practical, and it's essential for security. And we work with partners around the world to provide peoples, organizations, governments with the kind of very practical tools and approaches uh, to resolve and prevent violent conflict. Um, a couple of very quick housekeeping notes. First, our speaker today will be speaking in Arabic. Please make sure that if you need a headset, you are turned to channel one. Uh, to listen to English, and Channel 6 to listen in Arabic. Uh, secondly, if you are active on social media, um, please use our Twitter hashtag, hashtag JaburiUSIP, which you also see on the screen behind me. Um, Mr. Speaker, welcome back. Thank you for being here with us uh, during your visit to Washington. We are honored to host you once again here at USIP. Um, also, I'd like to welcome Ambassador Yassin. It's always great to have you here with us at USIP. Um, and especially at this moment, because after years of conflict, Iraq is poised for its new stage in the next trajectory as a new democracy. So we congratulate the Iraqi people, the Iraqi government, the Kurdistan regional government on the very important progress to eliminate ISIS from their country. Uh, this uh, also progress on returning displaced families home and on providing safety and security for the Iraqi people. And I think as we all know, these are critically important military defeats and it also opens the door to a number of additional challenges as Iraq prepares for parliamentary elections this spring. Um, we have the importance of having ongoing dialogues between the Kurdish regional government and Baghdad uh, over territories in northern Iraq. Uh, there's the challenge of the presence of sectarian militias it's still in many liberated areas and the continued displacement of thousands of families um, all of these present important challenges going forward. And there is simply the imperative of creating confidence in the, in the minds of the Iraqi people that next year's election will be free and fair, and it will be an opportunity really to determine the country they all want. Um, it's the opportunity to show that progress is possible for peace with all of Iraq's people, the Shias, the Sunnis, the Kurds, the minorities, that it is possible and practical. Um, it's also a very important time for the United States government and all of Iraq's international partners to continue essential engagement with Iraq, uh, to help ensure the safety and legitimacy of the upcoming elections, and continue to support those development initiatives that foster peaceful coexistence. Um, U.S. Institute of Peace has been working in Iraq since 2003 uh, with the goal of bolstering the abilities of Iraqis to halt communal violence, to save lives, to build social cohesion. And over the last decade, U.S. Institute of Peace has supported dialogue initiatives that bring people together across divides uh, and forge sustainable agreements to uh, stem the tide of violence and conflict at the local level, in their communities. And the results of these initiatives have provided the safety and security that have allowed thousands of Iraqis to return to their homes already. So today, USIP is working with leaders from liberated areas across Iraq, including in Hawija, Talafar, Bartala, to ensure sustainable and inclusive security for their populations. Um, and we also work with Iraq, Iraq's minority communities to strengthen their participation in decisions that affect their safety, uh, their rights, and their inclusion as an integral part of Iraqi society. Mr. Speaker, USIP remains committed to working with you 
uh, with the Iraqi government and with the people of, the, of Iraq as you create innovative and effective solutions facing, uh, to the obstacles that are facing your country. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to have His Excellency Speaker Salim Al-Jabouri with us here today. And Dr. Al-Jabouri has devoted much of his career in the service of his country. He was first elected a member of parliament in 2005, where he served as chairman of the Human Rights and Legal Committees. Dr. Al-Jabouri was elected speaker of the Iraqi parliament in July 2014, uh, after having served in parliament for nearly a decade. He's a former law professor um, and one of the most prominent Sunni leaders in Iraq. Um, we're delighted to have you back for a second time to U.S. Institute of Peace. Everyone, please welcome me. In in, please join me in welcoming Speaker of the Iraq Council of Representatives, Dr. Salim Al Jabouri. <laughs> In the name of Allah, I would like uh, to thank USIP uh, for their kind invitation and for their efforts uh, that exerted uh, in Iraq uh, during difficult uh, conditions in Iraq, uh, especially with the sensitive uh, issue uh, they are dealing with, the national reconciliation in a very complicated uh, areas in Iraq, whether Tel Afar and Yathrib and other uh, uh, areas uh, we are very grateful and thankful for USIP and we would like to express uh, uh, our uh, willingness to continue this partnership. <coughs> I would like uh, to thank uh, USIP for their kind invitation and I wish today's discussion will come with a mutual understanding that serve the mutual interests of, of our countries and the humanity at large. It is imperative to listen to your views um, uh, and va valuable advice. I would like to seize these minutes to give you some thoughts uh, as an introduction to open a window for deep dialogue regarding the serious issues that politicians and decision makers should seriously examine and arrive with mature solutions for the present problems. Two years ago, we met here and discussed a couple of issues. I still remember that I said that the solution for Iraq starts with the establ establishment of a civil state and neutralize the any arms possessed beyond the arms uh, and the constitution. Let us start with the military side where our soldiers are fighting. Iraqi army is close to finalize combat operations against ISIS and their alleged state that possessed a territory, an army, and an entity. We can say that ISIS has been eliminated as a geographical entity thanks to the profession that Iraqi army fought with and the advice and assistance Iraq received for, for, from the United States-led coalition. It is true that our country wouldn't have been able to overcome this crisis without the U.S.-led international support, neither would have the Iraqi army survived. Nevertheless, the military victory is not enough alone to confront terrorism. It should be accompanied by political victory. It starts with treating the causes that led to the appearance of ISIS. Now is the time to begin a nationwide campaign to confront extremist thought and sectarianism by activating educational institutions, attracting the youth, concentrating on achieving comprehensive stability and promoting national reconciliation, peaceful coexistence, the return of the IDPs, and tackling the economy development and investment in the areas affected by terrorism. We had successful meetings with officials from the World Bank and the IMF and explained to them how important it is to support Iraq to activate governing and support the stability 
and approving the legislations that fight terrorism and support the private sector. I believe that the next phase in fighting ISIS will be harder, not for Iraqis who gained battlefield experience to counter especially organized surprise attacks, but the difficulty is for the remaining countries that suffer terror attacks targeting public institutions and the civilians. I believe that the threat will grow more because, as you know, this terror entity has adopted the Lonely Wolves technique as a fighting strategy to target more civilians and cause as lethal attacks as possible as a means of a pressure on the Western world to manifest the strength of the terror organization and its existence and brutality. The next phase in Iraq does not require more arming and training as much as an open mentality and to adopt coexistence and protect the diversity and winning the hearts of the people and convince them of peace and the necessity of supporting stability. These requirements possibly will not need more financially funded programs, but educational reinforcement that to protect the society from extremism in all its forms and rejects sectarianism and ethnic propaganda to win the voices of the frightened and those who are worried about their future because of fearing the other that is claimed uh, by the benefited. Allow me to say that the international community is responsible of supporting us in this effort and facilitate the tools for its achievement. We are facing a serious problem in the next stage where weapons are spread among the community and the society get militarized due uh, to the confrontation that, done by the Iraqi community engaged in this historical confrontation. Today, we are close to the end of this war, but facing other challenges and responsibilities stated in the Iraqi constitution, that is ending weapons positions outside the state control and preventing these weapons to affect the elections, which are supposed the elections to be civil democratic participation. While we appreciate the great sacrifices of all our fighters, we are facing the challenging of ensuring stipends and arming of these fighters, in addition to ensuring the appreciation these fighters deserve. As the threat of ISIS started to fade, and while we were about to start a new phase of stabilization and reconstruction, we faced another serious problem that threatened the unity of Iraq, and it was no less dangerous than the crisis of terror confrontation. The conditions got complicated to an extent we never hoped for. A loving part of the homeland was about to vote for cessation. I personally endeavored to contain this crisis and I engaged in a detailed talks between Baghdad and Erbil before the referendum. I believe this solution starts where we all believe in unconditional, unconditioned dialogue from either side. I believe that Erbil is more realistic today in accepting dialogue as well as Baghdad uh, that recognize how important is that. The containment, all the Iraqi components, including the cities hit by terror, is a great opportunity for the state. In the meantime, they represent serious danger on the state. 
If the Iraqi authority adopted the idea of containing and supporting the Iraqi communities that possess the real power and looking for stability and accelerate the construction and job creation, job creation plans and moving with the national reconciliation faster in the liberated areas, the Iraqi people living there will be a perfect opportunity to build real security and stability capable of confronting the terrorist sleeping cells and end these cells and understand the hard lessons. If marginalization and diminishing policies were adopted again, the terrorist groups will use the IDPs and those who lost their loved ones and properties as a new material for recruitment by mobilizing sectarianism and promoting the spirit of hatred and revenge. The case of IDPs can turn into a serious problem if it is not solved very soon. It is imperative to work on their return quickly without conditions. Any demographic change will complicate the national reconciliation and eventually end our hopes of stability. I believe, we, ha ladies and gentlemen, I believe we have an opportunity to invest in the role of the youth and women in these areas to achieve stability, which relies on three factors. First, the return of the IDPs, the start of the reconstruction. Third, supporting and reinforcing social diversity and coexistence between peoples in single areas and confront any cultural, any culture of isolate, isolating components or demographic changes targeting a specific group. Moreover, it is very important to perform a real political reform where we can achieve decentralizing, decentralization in these governorates as the constitution states. Elections cannot be held unless the tools necessary for its success are available. We are withholding the elections within the legal and constitutional timing. Yet, we reiterate that there are serious and important priorities need to be fulfilled promptly before it is too late. These priorities are the return of the IDPs, achieving stability for them, to ensure widest participation of all Iraqi components in the elections. Iraqi people have suffered a lot and deserve a better life for the sacrifices they made. In a brief, we, ha in a brief, we have a great opportunity to achieve stability that all the region can enjoy. But this will not happen without the help of Iraq's friend. Eliminating terrorism in all its titles is, a, is, a, is an objective and those who are calling for sectarianism and division must be confronted. Promoting democracy principles, believing in the principle of the state, and preventing any regional country or regional power for manipulating Iraq internal affairs. We are against any negative interference that target the social fabric of the country. Iraq recently started initiative to engage more in, in public diplomacy with the Arab countries. And we are on the road to maintain our sovereignty and engage in bilateral relations based on mutual interest with all countries in the region. It is important to, for Iraq to be an example for investment and stability buildings. The problems that Iraq is facing can reflect negatively on the region unless they are treated. In the meantime, if there is a type of stability uh, and an a international aid uh, to Iraq, all uh, positive uh, effects will reflect in the region. And we can achieve a kind of stability uh, to Iraq and the region. This is our message that we delivered to all the officials, whether in the White House or in the Congress, that the United States, uh, within the international coalition, as the United States helped Iraq uh, in the uh, campaign against uh, ter uh, 
ISIS, uh, the United States can uh, play a great role in contributing to Iraqi reconstruction. Thank you. Would you care to take the stage and then we'll have a period of questions and answer? Okay. Mr. Speaker, thank you for your opening remarks and to addressing the U.S. Institute of Peace for the second time. We welcome you back. My name is Michael Yaffe. I am the Vice President for Middle East and Africa programs here at the Institute, and I have the honor to continue the dialogue with you. Uh, one set of housekeeping is that I will begin by asking a couple of questions to you, and then we are open to uh, have the audience pose questions. We are asking you to do that by writing them down and then passing them to the sides where they will be brought forward to me and I will read them to you. Um, let me begin by um, uh, talking more about what it means uh, for Iraq in the context of the defeat of ISIS. Um, you have been speaker of the Council of Representatives since 2014. And during that time, we saw the expansion of ISIS and then we saw the defeat of ISIS. Um, you, you talked a lot in your opening remarks about um, uh, notions of moving uh, Iraq on a domestic agenda, but I'm, I'm still curious to know what uh, the council is going to do in terms of solidifying the defeat of ISIS, how it will help the military, what happens to the uh, uh, popular mobilization forces. How do you see the agenda, at least, particularly going forward into the May 2018 elections. Shukran. Uh, Thank you very much. On June 10th, uh, ISIS uh, started uh, targeting, uh, targeting uh, Iraq. The Iraqi uh, parliament started, uh, started in 20, on July 1st. There was a public uh, concern uh, about uh, what's happening in Iraq, um, and that Iraq was occupied by extremists and uh, terrorists. And the forces uh, of ISIS uh, arrived at the outskirts of Baghdad, and they were very close to uh, to enter Baghdad. And people started complaining why the government, the parliament, is active, and what is the use of uh, the parliament. We had a challenge um, to prove. <laughs> to everybody uh, that if we want to clear Iraq from ISIS, we should continue work. We should have the desire and the willing uh, to, uh, to adopt practical steps and, uh, and uh, take the steps towards the reform of Iraq, and this way we can get rid of ISIS. If we compare uh, Iraqs today and the beginning of our parliament term in July 1st, 2014, third of Iraq was occupied by ISIS. Today it's liberated um, due to the efforts. Uh, first, the, uh, the Iraqis who, who confronted uh, ISIS in Iraq, and of course with the US-led uh, coalition. Uh, Iraq's relations was disrupted with the countries in the region. And uh, Iraq uh, was uh, as, uh, uh, a field for proxy wars. Uh, we suffered three million IDPs uh, who left their, uh, uh, their towns without exceptions. Minorities, Azidis, Christians, uh, we were uh, watching the sufferings that Iraq uh, was enduring. I do not claim that all the problems in Iraq have been solved. But we have developed, uh, we have progressed positively. Today, our relations is much better with the Arab countries, with the regional countries. Today, Iraq is seeking to maintain its own sovereignty. Our job as a parliament uh, has a lot to do uh, in this regard, uh, along with the, uh, with the work done by the Iraqi cabinet. 
our message is not to be desperate. Even if we witnessed uh, some uh, 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 some chaos, but the origin and the principle is to build the national state of Iraq. The question, uh, have we uh, uh, built the uh, Iraqi state in the right way? The answer is no. The, the, there are other challenges remain. The position of arms uh, with military groups be outside the government seeking political programs, uh, seeking uh, to interfere in Iraqi affairs, whether by himself or pushed by other regions. Iraqi parliament <coughs> passed a, ru a ruling, a bill, to, uh, to legalize the PMF. What is the end uh, of those who carried those weapons? Those volunteers are divided into two categories. The first group are affiliated with the Iraqi army and receive orders from the prime minister. Those who meet military requirements can be enrolled in the army. The second group are military groups not affiliated with the army and the prime minister. These factions must be dissolved and not be allowed to participate in the elections um, uh, and uh, stop them from preventing any um, uh, uh, any attacks against the community. Those who are outside the PMU and the Iraqi army uh, are, are considered outlaws. Uh, 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 وأثرت على العراق دولة و... You talked about education. Um, you talked about jobs. Um, but again, I, I want to hear how um, the Iraqi Council of Representatives is taking up those issues with specific issues of legislation. And particularly, how is that legislation being um, spread out throughout Iraq at the local level? Because that is where issues of inclusiveness are most felt to be part of the overall state, um, and not just necessarily in the, in the individual provinces. But I want to hear if you could, uh, what again is the agenda of the council in bringing that forward? Uh, <clears throat> there are two issues, to be clear. Uh, it is a mistake uh, to that the, the state depended heavily on the public sector. And those uh, who get enrolled in the public s s uh, sectors um, uh, felt they are uh, guaranteed by a monthly salary. Today, uh, due to the economic condition uh, of Iraq, uh, the Iraqi government see how important it is to concentrate on the private sector. Uh, during our uh, talks to the World Bank and the IMF, uh, we uh, discussed how we can encourage the uh, private sector how we can encourage uh, the youth uh, to be more engaged in the private sector. This is the uh, basic uh, problem uh, regarding the legislations we should adopt to encourage uh, youth and make use of the energy they have. Uh, ignoring the youth <coughs> can lead uh, to serious negative reactions. We uh, proposed uh, a couple of suggestions to reform the economy of Iraq. Uh, we are going to have an international conference of donors uh, in uh, Kuwait under, uh, with the international community and the donor countries. Uh, private uh, sector companies will be invited, including companies in the United States. We talked to the US Chamber of Commerce. Another challenge is confronting uh, corruption in Iraq that can help uh, uh, Iraq's uh, development. I believe the next phase, the basic uh, to 
to, uh, to guarantee stability is to concentrate on development and economy, to create an environment for uh, job creation and allow people to live peacefully. So I'm going to now turn to some of the questions we're getting from the audience, and I will tell you that at least the initial questions, a number of them are centered on the elections coming up in May 2018. Um, if I can kind of summarize where these questions are, they're, they are asking for a variety of issues. Um, they're asking, what, do you, what are your expectations with regard to the provincial elections, particularly in Nineveh and uh, Kabbalah? Um, there is the question of, uh, will there be a single Sunni coalition in the election? And, um, and will there be a, a, a coalition centered on Mr. Abadi? Regarding the elections, before uh, saying uh, my opinion, the, the problem uh, here that we have two parties uh, with their own arguments. The first team of politicians say that we should respect the timing uh, of the elections uh, stipulated in the Iraqi constitution. Be because if, we, if elections are not held, we will have no road map for the future of Iraq, and we'll end up in a dark, dead-end tunnel. This team uh, says that the elections must be held anyway, because this is better, and it's a, a, a better guarantee for Iraq. The second team says that if the elections are held, all the tools should be provided. How elections could be held while so, uh, so many people are IDPs and cannot return to their homes. How can we have elections while there are military uh, groups that may, uh, sh may pressure the community to change the elections map? There are certain concerns that, uh, that some uh, parts of the community will not be represented in the next elections. Uh, they are concerned to hold the elections in this time. And they are talking about the possibility to postpone the elections. Uh, postponing the elections will require a legal and constitutional justification. <coughs> I believe uh, if we started from now to find a road map and end all the obstacles in the face of the elections, uh, including the return of the IDPs uh, uh, and preventing those who carry arms to participate in the elections and to hold transparent, credible uh, elections within a legal framework. Uh, otherwise, uh, I believe it would be difficult and complicated to hold the elections. This is regarding the elections. Regarding the uh, Sunni coalitions, political coalitions, I would like to draw your kind attention uh, about the, the mentality, those who think about the elections. Before 2014, before this legislative term, most of the components, including the Sunnis, were divided. Uh, one team claimed that uh, one team was in the political process, participating in the political process. But other Sunni components were outside the political process and were outside the country. What is new today, both teams, those who were outside and inside the, uh, the country, have united and agreed on the uh, general framework uh, of building a state. They did not start a coalition. Uh, election coalitions is something else. They talked about what they want from Iraq. They agreed that it's better for everybody to build the state and contribute to the building of uh, uh, Iraq in the right way, and that they should be a factor contributing to rebuilding Iraq. 
and to uh, and not to be ignored by others. This was not available in the past. But because those who are involved in politics in, in, from the beginning uh, delivered a message that they can work together on this. I do not deny that uh, some uh, uh, effects from inside Iraq and from outside Iraq also contributed uh, th for those all political factions to come into an understanding and agreement that they will, should all work for the good of Iraq. Is it possible for these coalitions uh, to support the current Prime Minister? We are waiting uh, first for the elections and the results of the elections. The Constitution is uh, clear about this and it says and says the largest uh, political uh, uh, group in the Parliament nominates the Prime Minister and presents it to the others to vote for. The question is, what is the largest political uh, party in the parliament? In the, in the previous elections, the, uh, the largest political uh, group was a kind of sectarian uh, uh, largest groups. When we were talking about Sunni, Shia, and Kurdish groups, what we are expecting that the next uh, largest political uh, group will be a cross-sectarian uh, group with a political dimension rather than sectarian dimension. You should uh, put it in those terms as well because a number of questions have focused on that idea of sectarianism. Um, and the, the issue of how to bring, incorporate people into that political process and what could be done to, uh, particularly to bring faith leaders into the positive role of reconstructing the state and um, and, and bringing stability. Um, another element that has been raised is this issue of corruption and the issue of saying that corruption, embezzlement, uh, and a, a lack of state security has reduced people's confidence in, in the government. And the question posed is, uh, what is the government going to do to address, uh, uh, to restore people's confidence? in the government, in the state, and what can the international community do to, to assist in that process? Uh, let me start with the second point, sir, with regarding corruption. Uh, the uh, corruption that has been diagnosed uh, is being uh, turned over to the court. Uh, and the court takes the necessary measure uh, against these cases. The more uh, uh, corruption is being fighted, uh, the more trust people will get again. Uh, if we just got uh, a public show and a media show uh, with a slogan to fight corruption, this is not convincing anymore for the community. <clears throat> the state should uh, start clearly is to diagnose the, where corruption is, to hold those who are involved accountable, regardless to his position or his political ranking. <clears throat> I believe uh, this is the pa basic point <clears throat> where the courts should cooperate with other uh, branches to fight corruption. Regarding the, uh, uh, the, uh, the devoted politicians, uh, it's a matter of a trust. Uh, 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 the question is, are we building the state of Iraq in the right way? So those devoted uh, to Iraq will contribute to the building of Iraq. Uh, some are participating in the political life, some are watching. Uh, some politicians uh, are watching what will happen, and I believe <laughs> there are a lot of uh, uh, competent Iraqi figures that can make a concrete change and they have not <coughs> started yet. Their role did not start yet either because uh, the opportunity was not given to them, uh, to, to them uh, or they are waiting for signals from uh, the uh, parliament and the uh, cabinet. It's the duty of the state to allow those devoted people to contribute.
specific question regarding the um, proposed legislation on personal status. Uh, the question is, the Parliament is considering a new civil status law that will allow girls of nine years old to be married. Uh, many consider this to be a violation of human rights and, um, and unacceptable. Uh, what is your views on this proposed legislation and do you see that this legislation will pass? Uh, talking about reforming the current civil status law, uh, let me go in some details if time allows. <clears throat> what has been proposed to the Iraqi parliament is not a bill. Uh, what the media has said uh, is not right. Uh, what has been proposed is a suggestion, an idea, and according uh, to Iraqi constitution, uh, a, a proposition can be made uh, by a member of the parliament and suggest a bill to be discussed. Uh, again, then a, a question would be raised, is, it, is that idea is accepted or not? What happened is only the early stage. Uh, there are still so many stages to be uh, to be followed till this turns to a bill. Uh, first to be discussed, examined um, in details, and then voted for. In general, my personal <coughs> position, I'm against this law. Everybody uh, is against the marriage of minors. Uh, although uh, I read the bill in details, it, does, it did not refer that the law allows the minors' uh, girls to get married. Uh, this uh, point does not exist in the law. Uh, but it said that the different Islamic uh, uh, justifications allow, um, uh, uh, allow the marriage of the minors. The civil, uh, the current civil status uh, law allows a girl in the age of 15 to get married, which is a minor. Uh, I'm not defending the issue, but I'm saying that the bill is just a proposal uh, and based on my personal rejection and, uh, and the rejection of other MPs uh, will not find the way uh, to be passed. Uh, there has been a lot of argument and uh, controversy, controversy regarding the bill. Thank you. Um, I'd like to turn a little more now to the international elements. And uh, the question is, is that, well, this week, as you have come to Washington, you have been meeting uh, with uh, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Paul Ryan. Um, and this is part of uh, a long relationship you now have with the United States. How do you see the future of the relationship between the United States and Iraq going into the future, particularly in this now post-ISIS stage? <clears throat> uh, frankly speaking, in the uh, past there was a clear cooperation between Iraq and the U.S. in fighting uh, ISIS. And the U.S.-led coalition uh, helped a lot to end terrorism in Iraq. Today, there is a dividing line to a next stage, which is achieving stability. Uh, talking uh, about that Iraq is left alone uh, to uh, reconstruct itself and achieve stability uh, alone should come to an end. Everybody uh, should uh, realize, including the United States, should realize that supporting Iraq in the post-ISIS uh, period should continue and increased. Uh, uh, the post-ISIS period requires stability and we should learn from the lessons of the past and, uh, and prevent terrorism from reappearing uh, in Iraq. We have a lot of potentials, <coughs> economy and development. Leaving Iraq vacant will cause others to come and interfere. <coughs> Uh, our past experience uh, showed that 
when the uh, U.S. left Iraq, uh, many negative interferences uh, came uh, to happen in Iraq. It is important to prevent this from happening in the future. Um, in many respects, what you just said is sort of a, sort of a lesson learned of what has happened uh, in the past few years. I wonder if you could also draw um, some other lessons that, could, that we should take from the most recent fight against ISIS, and particularly uh, more broadly beyond just Iraq itself. And uh, as these fighters are, are moving around, what do you also see in terms of what happens to the families of the fighters? And how are those individuals going to be treated? There's this fear that if they are not somehow um, integrated into the communities, that this becomes a foundation for what could be ISIS 2.0. So I wonder how you view that. Uh, what's happening now, the families of ISIL members, uh, women and children, are being isolated and camped, and kept in special camps. Uh, these camps are called uh, camps for uh, ISIS families. Uh, I had a discussion with the Ministry of Immigration. Uh, personally, uh, I am against this, uh, this, what's happening with this. First, those are children. When you keep those children in a special camp, uh, and entitle them as ISIS, you are pre-accusing uh, pre them of being uh, ISIS members. And uh, this fact will remain with him in all his life. And he will always be called. He is an ISIS uh, camp family or ISIS camp child. First, he, he should be treated as a, a child who made no mistake. Uh, he had no mistake of what his parents or his father done. Even the women, uh, women uh, should be also uh, uh, reconsidered. Indeed, many of the wives of ISIS members participated in the fight, but other, uh, other uh, have not. Uh, we should have a transition period where we can reintegrate the children and the women in Iraqi community. This child in the future will look to his uh, friends and colleagues uh, and he will feel inferior uh, for not having the education uh, he deserves. Uh, we should not repeat uh, the mistake of the presence. My colleague, former uh, Minister of Interior, the uh, the prisons uh, uh, in Iraq after 2003 where uh, extremists and hardliners were kept uh, in these jails some of them were uh, wrongly accused some of them were convicted those detainees left the jail more extremist than the way he was uh, detained in the beginning we do not want temporary camps uh, to turn into a production unit of extremist and hardliner, hardliners. Um, the, my next question concerns the Iraqi army and this issue that the army has been a uniting element in Iraq's history. Um, and um, the, uh, the issue is that the, the army, of course, um, basically suffered a defeat in 2014 by ISIS. What, what are the steps to go forward where the uh, Iraqi army could regain the respect of the people? How do you see the, the emerging role of, of the army in uniting Iraq? Today, people have more trust and confidence in the Iraqi army. Today, the community is not looking to the Iraqi army the way they looked at it in 2014, where terrorist group could easily control the areas controlled by the army. Today, the army is welcome, regardless uh, to the, the army has been very wise with a lot of complicated issues during the fight. <coughs> 
In the meantime, it is very important to, uh, to make balance inside the Iraqi army. The Constitution clearly says uh, uh, that uh, the army should be balanced. And uh, a lot of uh, high-ranking officers uh, made heroic uh, uh, victories in the, uh, on the army. <coughs> the military institution represent a basics for the reform, for the next phase. To some extent, till now, uh, the Iraqi army uh, is a great value in, to all Iraqis. So my next question is, um, uh, how do you envision the role of the council going forward? Um, how do you see it shaping itself in order to provide for a more inclusive Iraq? Uh, what is your long-term vision for the parliament itself? And then in many respects, I'm asking, what do you expect to be, will be your legacy as the president of the council? The current parliament uh, is the result of the elections law. Uh, the elections that ha were held in 2014. Today, we are r revising the next elections law. Some say that the, cu the current elections law led to the appearance of a small political parties and did not maintain large political units. I believe that the uh, the uh, the revised uh, law of elections adopted uh, a system where large uh, political parties are maintained in the meantime allowing small parties to be represented in the parliament and represent the people who voted for like any establishment experienced difficult conditions and some drawbacks i can say during this term, the Iraqi parliament has never witnessed a kind of sectarian uh, uh, agenda. Even the problem with Kurdistan was politically addressed. In the past, uh, in the previous uh, terms of the parliament, sectarianism was very clear. Uh, second, this, the, the only uh, legislative term uh, which were ministers brought into hearing and investigation is this the current uh, parliamentary term. Uh, eight ministers were questioned in the parliament and some of them uh, were, uh, were released. The prime minister visited the, uh, prime, uh, the Iraqi parliament 15 to 20 times. Uh, these did not happen in the previous uh, uh, parliamentary terms. Today, Iraqi community uh, feels that there is a cooperation between the cabinet and the, the parliament. Uh, problems and disagreement do exist, but there is an understanding um, uh, that uh, it, it all should work for the country. We faced some problems uh, led uh, that the people uh, demonstrate and enter the parliament. Uh, this is what we have done uh, and we are proud of. It's a really good place for us to stop here. We want to thank you for being so candid in your conversation with all of us. Uh, we thank you for your opening remarks and we welcome you back to, the, to USIP and we hope you come and see us again when you come to Washington. So please join me in thanking Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain in your seats until the official party departs.